Welcome to episode 89 of Let's Talk Geek. In the show, ADSL price cuts and upgrades for everyone. Chat on or WhatsApp and Lumia phones are apparently found wanting by carriers. Thank you for watching. Welcome to episode 89 of Let's Talk Geek, recorded on the 18th of April, 2012. It's a Wednesday, as it always is. I'm Jan Vermeulen. I'm Gerrit Vermeulen. I'm Tim Hawk. And, and welcome to the show. Somewhere behind the desk is the mixer. Mixer. The mixer. All right. All right. So a couple of things. Um, the random for the show is that Prince of Persia, first release for the Apple II, was widely seen as a giant leap forward in video gaming for its quality of animation. And even though the gameplay was, you know, some people um, criticize the gameplay for being repetitive. It, it's, a, it's an action platformer. Mm -hmm. um, it was kept diverse through the level design and, uh, yeah, basically through the level design and the traps and the variety of the environments and the cool, awesome animations. Because the sword fighting was pretty much... It, uh, it's know, fairly basic. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's forward, <clears throat> hit, and block. And you can go back as well if you need to. And this has time. to do with 89? Because Prince of Persia was released in 1989 first for the Apple II. There we go. And the Apple II source code is now available on GitHub. Yes. Well done, Very Jordan cool. Mechner, original mm. creator. Well, well done for uh, finding and, and that. Do you know why it's been released? Why has it been released? Because he happened to find some old stiffies while going through some of his closets. Oh, actually stiffies in 1989. <laughs> or floppies. Could be, could be floppies. I was on floppies back then. Yeah. Well, um, we were... Fairly. No, the Apple II, I'm sure, had an external floppy drive. I, yes. don't, I, th I don't think the Apple II had yeah. a stuffy drive. Yeah. It might have eventually, but anyway, <laughs> that's the yeah. random. Um, that said, join us on IRC, irc.ltnet.tv, if you're watching us live. Um, don't, uh, can people navigate to that URL yet? Don't navigate to that URL. Which that is URL? irc.ltnet.tv. No, R someone please remind me. To make it so you can. <laughs> okay, you cannot navigate. That's not so a HTTP URL. That is an IRC URL. You put it into an IRC, IRC client. client. But if you want to make life a lot easier, go to uh, live.ltnet.tv. Where you're watching this anyway, and click the pop-up like chat button. Pop chat, Some people just don't find the pop-up chat button. Or click on both. And you can have the chat next to the video window. Yes, yes, but that's what pop-up... Chat? Pop-up chat actually no, pops out pops a chat window. Out. You uh, can click okay. on video plus chat, which then puts the chat oh, cool. next to the video. <laughs> nice, nice option. Might be a little bit cramped for some people, but yeah. it works well. We have some events coming up. Let's start with the Warthogs Beer Festival. I am so looking forward to this. <laughs> this sun, uh, Saturday, I will be there uh, tasting 80 different beers. That's a lot of beer. Dude, I hope that you're lining your stomach with some awesome <laughs> no, look, oily food. You, you actually, you don't, you don't taste all of them. Um, and when you when you get it you actually just have a very very small amount but look admittedly over that quantity of beers that you taste it, it does it's a happy evening it's a day it's off yeah. the 10 it's a happy day dude it's like Oktoberfest in April no this is better because it's 80 different beers and it's it's a full flavor range and I still remember last year I have to find this chocolate start to find last year <laughs> because it was just are these production oh, beers no these are all awesome. okay there's a couple microbreweries there so there's about five or six microbreweries okay but other than that the other large bulk of it are all home brewers and, and these are all guys who are passionate to do it for themselves they do it for fun uh, and they love it So, and you can geek out on beer we have just yes. proven it on Let's Talk Geek it's awesome <laughs> the other thing happening is the release of Diablo 3 and we're getting... I'm sorry. <laughs> we're back. I'm keen. <laughs> yeah. I am not. Um, and we'll get to that, but it's on the 14th of May 2012, midnight release. I still need to just double check. Is that midnight of the 14th or is that midnight of the 15th? Because the laymen tend to get those things confused. Midnight of the 14th is like, you know, just after the 13th. Yeah. And midnight of the 15th is just after the 14th. What people usually mean... If they say a midnight launch on the 14th is... On the 14th, you go there at uh, the 23.59 and then at and then midnight zero, zero, on the zero, zero, 15th. Zero. I would think it's the midnight of... The night of the 14th. Yes. Due to the 14th is a Monday. And they tend to not do these things on Sunday nights. That's a good enough reason as any. I'd go for that assumption. I'll double check that. We'll probably get some comments on RSC correcting our error. Um, if there was one, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> that would oh, be a yeah, thing. Where? It is at Rodemaz. You need tickets. If you do not have tickets, yeah, you will not it, be allowed it's in. It's somewhat exclusive. So you need someone who's at the fest. It's like getting into a frat. 
somebody has to be brewing beer yeah. to get tickets. Yeah. So you, no but tickets at the door type of thing. No. And how mm. how they actually basically hand out tickets is for the amount of liters of beer the guys donate, they get X amount of tickets. So oh, I don't wow. know what the exact ratio is. So like we, we, we have a set of friends who I think they didn't make the normal one, but I think they do, uh, they've done at least 40 liters of beer uh, and we have our tickets through them. But with that, it's 100 Rand for the ticket. Mm-hmm. And then the beer you taste off that is free. Now, having alluded to Diablo 3, why are you not looking for Diablo 3? Permanent internet connection required. Okay. We raked other companies over the coals. Let's Ubi- name them Ubisoft. Ubisoft and EA are the two that come to mind. Ubisoft, I mean... Assassin's Creed. Uh, exactly. I was so angry when they did that. And yet with Blizzard, we're just sucking it up. Yeah, it's amazing. Blizzard just gets a free pass for anything. They can... And, and it's actually amazing. We've known about no land mode in StarCraft. They got away with that. Yeah. And people, they were online petitions and they died quickly. And we saw how well that worked at uh, the gaming event last year. Uh, uh, the South African one. What's the uh, big game? Rage. Rage. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that the, the problem is, I mean, people do not give a rat's ass about how badly things are going in South Africa for, for lack of land support. So um, for their Korean market, I mean, South Korea has the best internet in the world, arguably. So, <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> anyway, having said that, like one of the guys in the RSC has said, is we're all assuming that it is a single player game. And I th- you can see they've actually put a lot of multiplayer elements in. I, I don't play. The thing is, I've okay, been playing then, the beta for months. Then Diablo I do 3, not play multiplayer a lot. Then Diablo 3 is an MMO. I don't want an MMO. But the thing is, it's not an MMO because you can only have four players in your server at any given time. It's not massive. So it's not massive. It's just multiplayer online. Yeah. And, and I mean, the, the way I play through Diablo has always been a single player experience. Mm. Multiplayer a, was just added bonus. Yeah, it it's was the cherry on top of yeah. the cake. Yeah. And I, I guess maybe I'm just an old school kind of gamer. But the problem I've got with multiplayer is that I, like, I end up with guys who just rush ahead. And on my first couple of playthroughs of the game, yeah. that's not how I do. I want to play. Yes. I want to savor the experience. Yes. Look, but I, I a year like or two not, afterwards with a multiplayer, yeah, we, then I'll we started rush Skeleton King. No, me. exactly. We started the, rushing through Diablo 2 and finishing the, Act 1 in a, a year or two or later. You'll be playing a different game. No, no, we were still playing D2. Yeah, but that's when you were younger, dude. Yeah, Trust okay. me, now I'm not going to have more yeah, than no, time. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Anyway, so Diablo 3, that's coming out. That's all exciting. If you didn't get your collector's edition pre-order in in South Africa, it seems toughies for you. You're out of luck. All the retailers sold off the, the pre-orders before the game was announced, <clears throat> um, like through specials and, and like uh, press wow. events and promotional events and stuff to go on a hype for their shops. Take a lot comes to mind. Um, BT Games don't have, a, don't have a collector's edition on order. I think you can pre-order. Sorry, you can pre-order, but you can't get a collector's head. Mm. If you want a collector's head, sorry for you, ne? Yeah, I think you well, can still pre-order. Well, what you do is you wait for the day after. Yes, that's and what then I you did go with to, that, That's what I did with StarCraft 2. Then you go to places like BT Games and whoever did the pre-orders, and you go and ask them first thing in the morning, do they have any pre-orders left? <laughs> um, because they, the people who don't collect them on the night... BT Games has a new policy. It's a week now. Oh, is it a week? Yeah. Okay, that's a pity. I got there? that with Mass Effect 3. That's a way to well, you week. can imagine but there's there a go. lot of guys who get upset. You know, I'd get upset. Get get the night, you know. I have a job. I yeah. can't get there necessarily yeah, know, on the day. Or people have kids. But that's what I did with StarCraft 2 because I just randomly heard on the night that that's the, the policy they're enforcing. Rocked up there, watched them open the doors and went in and asked. And I got me some cool. StarCraft 2 collectors. All right. Um, MWeb ADSL prices. Yes. yes. So this has been the big one that we've been waiting for. I just want to mention, hopefully we're looking forward to next week having a, a guest in from MWeb. Um, we will confirm once a bit closer to the time. Yes. Um, so watch our Google. We'll do it on Google Plus and Twitter. And we'll, we'll do it on all the YouTube I think accounts. we'll only announce on Twitter because that's a very active social network once it's firm. Yeah. Yes. Um, we did. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, on their side, there was logistic issues. Um, yeah. So it just has been moved back a week. So sorry for anybody who's listening to this to get the feedback from there. But please, if you any, have any questions, please uh, send it to us, Twitter, it's tweet us, Google Plus. There's a, a thread going on Google Plus. Quite on Facebook. Yeah, but the Google Plus email. thread, by the way, is under the South African pages thread. That's why I couldn't find it. The South oh, African. No, okay. that was actually my fault. It's actually under the, the, the Let's Talk Network thread. And I just happened to go to the wrong page when I was looking for it. Oh, okay. And because of it, it we, it's got all of the things, it just appeared there. Okay. But the idea being, send us your questions. Yeah, you know, um, I'll probably, I'll try to open a thread on my broadband closer to the time mm. um, as well. So, yeah, that'll be there as well. Cool. But uh, into the meat of it, which is the bottom line is they slash prices for 384 and one-meg connections. Yeah. To the and same price. To the same well, price. not quite the same price. Okay. Oh, it is the same price. Yeah, so yes. $199. Oh, it's the discount's different. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
The discount's different. So correct. what what they're trying to do there is they're trying to make one meg the new entry level. Is is that? I, I think uh, what the, basically the message we got is that Mweb anticipated the fact that Telcom, this is the next story in line, I think, um, that Telcom is going to bump up their ADSL speeds. Oh, okay. So um, if you were in IRC um, last week, you might have heard something to that effect. Um, and the, the rumor, wa- well, and, and uh, now we've got a, a source that re- revealed to us Telcom is planning to bump up 384 kbps to one meg, and the one meg, and one meg to two meg, two meg, and four meg guys. Sorry, well, there is, it should be ten meg, <laughs> except none of the, our damn exchanges yeah. can support it. Yeah. It's, it's, if you're one of the lucky twenty thousand users, it's probably bumped up to like fifty thousand by now. Um, that that has ten meg, then you've got ten meg. Otherwise, you're on four meg. Anyway. Um, uh, the only comment I've got there is sweet MWeb and uh, four meg ADSL is be- be looking far less attractive now. Cool. Yeah, I'm I'm very sad that four meg didn't get anything. It can't though, um, because of the limitations on the exchanges. So there are lots of congested exchanges. I mean, like price cuts. Oh, price cuts. That yeah. would be nice. Or for the ten megs. Yeah. yeah. So the the answer to that question, and hopefully we'll be able to pose that to Derek directly next week, was but it's priced well already. Well, if you look at it though, if I it's buy not bad, a, but a 10 meg is more than double the price of two four, you know, a four meg. It's about considerably more. It would cost me less to buy two four megs than to buy a 10 meg. Which it's sort of like, well, they don't want people to get 10 meg accounts. It's mm. pretty much mm. uh, not so yet. Comment comment from RSC is that people are fawning over MWeb. I think it should be it should be mentioned, but it was mentioned in uh, last week's show. Other ISPs came to the party first, and obviously the smaller guys need to be first. Um, we are still waiting on Telcom Internet to announce their Give them a month for price reductions and access. So I'm I'm actually listing the exceptions: access and uh, of among the the big the big names, access and Afrios still have to announce theirs, and they've told us that uh, the their product process is taking longer than they would have liked. Um, which is code for Internet Solutions hasn't reduced their wholesale pricing yeah. yet. Um, so once that gets done, you'll see a massive price reduction across um, third-party ISPs who use Internet Solutions as their upstream provider. They also say with this, you know, the other service providers are only an hour or two behind MWeb. So why are we giving the kudos to MWeb? It's because normally... What do I mean an hour or two behind MWeb? Oh, that's no, just what the RSC no, says. No, I don't remember any other, Maybe I'm getting it wrong, but I, don't, I remember lots of announcements before MWeb. Uh, Web Africa <coughs> and OpenWeb were among the first. Mm. Um, FNB announced um, uh, not a price cut, but a, but a cap yeah. hike for people with very specific bank accounts, it should be noted. And, um, and then, yeah, we were waiting on MWeb. Still no joy for capped customers. I'm waiting for more information on that. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's still a lot that can uh, And having said that, MWeb's price cut on the one meg is the best one out there, to my knowledge. Unless yeah, it makes uncapped look, I mean, it one makes uncapped, uncapped it I remember the days really when good. we paid 190 rand, rand a month for dial-up. Well, look, we, we're doing a comparison of work because we, we're doing a lot of things with, with um, OpenWeb's local uncapped, which is 139, quarter 140 rand for 30 local. It's now looking better to actually just go buy a one meg uncapped from Emu. Wow. That's compared that, to local bandwidth. <laughs> Un- uh, well, 30, me- uh, 30 gigs, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, Bitstream data has been announced. Yep. So for those who don't know what Bitstream is, it's a, it's a type of local loop unbundling. Um, if you don't know what local loop unbundling is, Google it. M- Mark, um, what's the difference between this and IP Connect? <laughs> yes. Because I'm actually not sure. It's 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 um, the way ISPs describe it is IP Connect, and and I know Ant Brooks from ISPA was vehement uh, when I brought it up with him because he hates people referring to IP Connect as a Bitstream product. Mm-hmm. But I think that is in part because um, true Bitstream allows ISPs a lot of freedom, whereas IP Connect is an almost hobbled. Bitstream product, so it's it's a form of Bitstream because it, it is a handover of bits. Yeah, but it is not true Bitstream. And so when you hit the Wikipedia article for Bitstream, for example, it'll explain in nice bullet point form that there are three different handover points. You can hand over at the hardware, well, sort of hardware level, at the DSLAM. Yeah, you can hand over at on the on the sort of ATM protocol level, um, and you can hand over on the IP level. 
And so it, I, I don't know what kind of bitstream we're talking about. We have heard rumors of an, uh, a, telecom, a new telecom wholesale product called IPStream, which has been in testing for quite some time. I, bel- I may be speaking on a correction, but I think Internet Solutions tested it. I know, I know t- a Telcom has been uh, testing a bitstream because I know during the ICOSIC mm-hmm. hearings, they yeah. did mention, you know, they say they can't, but they have been actually testing it and it has been working quite nicely, apparently. Yeah, yeah. So look, yeah. So IP stream, that's still, uh, IP stream, as the name implies, is still an IP handover point, but it, it will apparently, the handover point is where the handover occurs in the telecom network to the ISP. Um, and, uh, and so I've, I've heard some things. Um, I don't want to repeat anything in case there, it's not entirely accurate and, and maybe my understanding isn't complete. Um, okay. But it sounds like the handover will give ISPs um, a lot more freedom and will release some of Talcom's control over the end user. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll see we'll, well see how that goes. Hopefully it means authentication and PPO might be able to be done by the... At the, at the very least, um, that's how I understand it. The, the auth- but that, all that means is that the administrative overhead moves to ISPs. That's just a shifting in cost. All of a sudden, people have to maintain their own infrastructure for mm. auth and, and ha- dishing out of IPs and stuff. I mean, that's not really a benefit. Yeah, yeah but it's knowledge. not actually not that hard to do it. But now think, your competitor who's Telcom, has all the details for your clients. Yeah, that's... You never want that. Yeah, sure. And um, being able f- for ISPs to be able to build, say, business products with static IPs and things, this will hopefully give yeah. them a lot more freedom in that regard. Not that those products don't exist already, but well, we don't know. We don't know really what this will cause. Also, I know as they move it closer and closer to the exchange, you can actually save some bandwidth if you because you can route I- inside the exchange rather than yeah. routing. But or to that one I think implies equipment co-location, which yeah. will mean I mean the small ISPs will not be able to to do that uh, kind of thing. I think. It, look, uh, yeah, because uh, right now what ISPs do is they they locate their points of presence in various like Web Africa launched in Cape Town, but they've got a point of presence in Johannesburg now as well. Mm. Uh, MWeb has three points of presence. I think that's it's the only ISP I can think of with three. Oh, except for Telcom, um, <laughs> who, who has every single exchange. <laughs> um, I don't know if they, if they're, if Telcom Internet's allowed to work like that. Um, but uh, yeah, but the point is that all your ADSL traffic, I as an MWeb user, have to talk to their point of presence at Terraco first before my traffic gets routed to whoever I'm talking to. So even though I'm talking to a local user, say I'm gaming against a guy in Pitsal or Water, yeah, my traffic and his traffic first has to go to the nearest point of presence. Um, even though there might be a closer intermediate point. So the latency, I mean, there does have a latency uh, implication, Impact, yeah. but I mean, the average user who it's cares. It's the way it works, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, having said that, I know the reason why a lot of them use Cape Town is the IP Connect is the cheapest there. Just for interest sake. Mm, mm. Right, anyway, from that. Yeah. And um, we should just mention, if you didn't catch it in the last show, IP Connect prices were slashed by 30%. Uh, which means that the wholesale cost of ADSL provisioning in South Africa went down. Which is probably where the price slashes came from. Yes, which is exa- exactly. That's where MWeb's price cuts came from. That's where everybody else's price cuts came from. And, and, and I, I have to say it, well done, Ecasa and Telcom. Um, yeah. I'm fairly sure this is some sort of agreement between the two. It's not Ecasa just stamping down its foot um, because Telcom quietly allowed it. Uh, if, if Telcom didn't agree, they would make it. Make, you know, yes. a lot like, of like, like they generally do. Yeah, um, yeah. So, but the fact is... It's tangible results. I don't care. Uh, in fact, if it came from a discussion and cons- uh, not concessions, but an, an agreement and a, and, uh, and a compromise, whatever. That's movement. fantastic. Movement. Yes. So all we want is movement. Just keep it up. Well done, your A little step at a time. I it's been a long I don't time. Mind baby steps. Yeah. Baby steps frequently. Yes. Release what? <laughs> release, release early, release, release often. often. We, we can't have, have early, at least let's have often. For Open now. source everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyway, uh, next to thing, just going off this topic slightly into something totally different. Because it's we're, awesome. We, we're one step closer to the matrix. Um, basically, they have a cyborg snell that is a tiny power plant. Um, and basically, this is using um, a bit of... Basically, the snail, the snail have got little electrodes and stuff inside the snail that basically uses its sugars that it's producing to produce, look, a very small amount of electricity, but enough that they say one day you can start maybe buying little cameras and you can have your snail spies going everywhere. They're talking about that. Um, and even they start talking about the stuff they're also doing, which is, okay, but more creepy, where they're actually turning the animals into little robots. And they're actually apparently quite far with the cockroaches. Uh, but it's mainly cyborg cockroaches. Do they understand what they're doing? Have they got any concept of what they're Though, doing? Having said that, they have <laughs> sealed our fate. <laughs> the cockroaches won't be intelligent. 
That's what they think now. So that's creating, how... One of the coolest things, those, those psychic rats from AD&D, or the geth, that they become more intelligent the more of them there are together. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm thinking more they, they're creating the minions for Skynet. Absolutely. That's yeah. a start. That they can With be everywhere. cockroaches. Dude, uh -huh. now we've got cockroaches on the ground, quadrocopters in the air. We're doomed. And snails we're... in the garden. Little Spying on you. Yes, <laughs> slowly. Um, apparently the why the insects are so cool is they go through the different stages of development and you can embed it in one of the earlier stages and then they actually keep on growing. That then grows inside the control systems. Yeah. Cool. Cool, cool bananas. That is awesome. Yep, and so that brings us... Uh, to a completely different topic, which is uh, hardware buttons on Android phones. Do we have a, uh, Android phones with hardware yeah, we, buttons here? Yeah, we do. Yes. I've got an HTC Desire here. Somewhere. Technically, uh, this is a hardware button. Uh, uh, that that, that button at the bottom, hold it up to the camera. Hold it up to the camera. The hardware, the, the button in the middle is the home button, and that's a hardware button. And there's button. two. Te technically, and those, those there's a hardware capacitive button. buttons also oh, count hardware as hardware buttons. buttons. Yes. Yes. It's only software buttons if it's physically on the screen of yes. the device. So, so this is also hardware buttons. This is the Xperia S. We'll These are some new phones. We'll talk about the new phones later. We got them for review from LG and Sony. Sony. Yeah. Uh, so what, what I'm getting at here is I'm a little bit tired of hearing people mention Android and Ice Cream Sandwich and how phones with hardware buttons will struggle to upgrade to Ice Cream Sandwich uh, because you'll, have, uh, you, you'll end up with the hardware buttons being useless at the bottom. I don't know why they're saying this. I don't know where they got their information from because they're completely wrong. <laughs> this is my Nexus S. It is updated to Android 4.0.3 over the air. Um, and for those of you not familiar, it, it has four hardware buttons at the bottom. So the way it was built, because it's last year's phone. The Galaxy Nexus came out end of last year. Yes. Here's the Galaxy Nexus. It has software buttons with ice cream sandwich. Um, you can't see them from the lock screen, but they're at the bottom. There they are. So those are software buttons. These are hardware buttons. These are both running ice cream sandwich. And, and it's working fine. It works perfectly. And what, what these people are getting at, I, I'm not sure. They, they seem to think that Ice Cream Sandwich is enforcing software buttons, which is not. It's offering manufacturers the choice between software and hardware buttons. So you can choose whether you want them or not. And like on a tablet, software buttons to me make a whole lot of sense because you're yeah, rotating you, the tablet. And if, you into, full, and if you full screen an app, you've got more screen real estate. Yes. Oh, look, I would also imagine as time goes forward, it's, even on phones, software buttons is the better route to go. Potentially. Um, your, your screen is also so, it, it's smaller on a phone. Having, uh, for me, having the software buttons in one place isn't that bad. It's not much of a deficit. With a tablet, if you turn it upside down and your buttons are on the other end, that, that to me is a bigger deal. Zoom well, that. look, well, no, but I, I, the one I think <laughs> about is, problem, is the iPad. It? No. Right? The, the iPad has that one hardware button, and then if you, you, know, you rotate it, the button changes, so you might lose your place or something like that. Um, Android tablets don't. Yeah, but, the, so the, but Android tablets the, have more than one button. Having the one yes. Uber Apple button either at your right yes. thumb or, or your left at thumb, the bottom. You need to keep track of that, whereas with software buttons, they'll always be in the same place. Look, so Ice Cream Sandwich is not forcing anyone to move over to software buttons. You can still use hardware buttons just fine. Yes. So please stop saying that. <laughs> please. Anyway. Do you feel better? I do. Okay, cool. Moving along. <laughs> Guild Wars. Yep. So for those who don't know, Guild Wars 2 pre-orders opened in South Africa last week. Um, and uh, we didn't get to chat about it, so I wanted to mention it this week. I have, um, if you ordered the collector's edition um, from BT Games, they make you pay the full price before, um, the reason is you get an early access key. So they want to make sure they have their money before they give you the game. Um, so that's pretty cool. If you pre-order Guild Wars, if you get the collector's edition, you get in like two days before everybody else. If you get the normal edition, I think you get in a day before the game, the game actually launches. You get to preload um, before, the, before you pick up your retail copy. Um, and you get to play before you pick up your retail copy. It's all very awesome. So um, I, I don't want to talk too much about Guild Wars 2 because there's far too much to say. Um, and perhaps when we get my gaming on again, we'll get them to go in depth on Guild Wars 2. But I did want to point you guys at a YouTube channel of a guy calling himself Sage Like One. And what's great about Sage Like One, and the link is being pasted into IRC now shortly, um, is 
that he takes requests from the community about stuff that people want to see. And then he shows it to them or he discusses it with them. If you, if you want to understand mechanics more, for example, Guild Wars has a world event mechanic mm-hmm. that lets, you know, uh, it, the first Guild Wars, for those of you who don't know, it seems like Tim is having trouble pasting things. I, I, I'm gonna paste it's it. not letting me copy and paste from Google Docs at the moment. I'll paste it. Cool. Paste it. So um, the original Guild Wars was completely instanced, basically. You, the only place that there were large groups of people were in town. And uh, Guild Wars 2 changes that. And that's part of the reason they decided to go for a sequel, was to go more massively multiplayer. And um, so similar to Rift, for those of you who have played Rift, they're going to have these massive world events and, and even smaller sort of localized events, but with triggering conditions and, and sort of steps in the process. So, for example, you um, might have to protect the town um, or, or help defeat, you know, bandits on a bridge or whatever or, or get, you know, stop them from blowing up a bridge. If you fail, the bridge is gone. Um, it, and the thing is, the, the whole sequence does reset after a while and the bridge comes back. But for that period, the bridge is gone. And then the whole thing plays out, you know, up to a point. And so it's actually very interesting. They're going to have these branching world events. So it's, it's going to be an MMO with resetting events the whole time. But they will, be on, they will be sequential. So you'll have to defeat stage one to progress to stage two. Cool. And, defi- and depending on which stages you fail at, that will unlock different parts of the quest effectively and it's going to be big so you'll have to pull in the whole server uh, to come and help you and, and that sort of thing you'll so, have the server running next to you <laughs> Sorry. and so Sage Like One helps people show that he, he, or helps show features like that he, he also you know showcases classes skills uh, the whole nine yards so yeah Guild Wars 2 is looking interesting probably the coolest thing they've done is they've done away with a healer class I know some people like healers it's probably the most boring role I've ever played is, is running around in an MMO healing people um, everybody self heals. Everybody does damage. It sounds awesome, and it, like it's going to be an awesome amount of fun. Best part, sorry, best part, better even than not having healer classes. No monthly subscription. It's an MMO, as you, with Guild Wars. You pay once off if, if you pay it, if you bought the collector's edition, a thousand three hundred rand. Yep. Um, it's the normal edition's like four fifty. There should and be some good stuff in that collector's edition. I hope so. Carry and you never pay a subscription fee. Though I'm sure they'll introduce microtransactions yeah, at some point. Yeah, they'll probably have microtransactions, but... Anyway, awesome. that's Guild Wars 2. Cool. Cool. So, uh, <laughs> Samsung chat on. Uh, we, we have a fight coming. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> you start, then we tell you why you're wrong. <laughs> okay, Samsung chat on has announced that they've released for BlackBerry. It's an instant messaging application. It's, yes. Um, so, kind of like WhatsApp. For phones, so far it was on Android, it was on iOS. Is it more like WhatsApp or more like Google Talk? Does it use your cell phone number or do you need an account? Uh, it uses your cell phone number, so it's okay. more like WhatsApp in that okay. sense. Do you have a username and password at all? Not as far as I know, no. Okay. Um, you, you may have to select a PIN when you initially start up, but you don't ever have to punch I it in. I think WhatsApp requires. It also has well. a PIN, but you never have to push it in mm-hmm. again. Mm-hmm. I think that's only if you uninstall and reinstall. I've never even switched had to over to yeah. Yeah, anything. Um, was for Android and iOS, and I believe there's a... Was originally for Android, then came to iOS. Came to iOS. Now they've released the BlackBerry client. And I, as, as far as I remember, there's also a web-based uh, way to, to use it. Okay. So there's All that. Right. If there's a web-based way, how do you identify yourself? I, honestly, I, like I say, I, have, I haven't used it. I don't think there's a web-based way. I'm not entirely sure. Unless they let you log in with your cell phone number somehow. I think right. so. Why is this better than WhatsApp? Well, with WhatsApp, after a year, which they've extended to another year, all sorts of stuff, you have to pay two bucks, which doesn't sound like much, I know. I think it's eight rand. <laughs> At, no, well, one dollar. One dollar. One do- it's one dollar. One dollar. So one dollar. So chat on is free. It's over across platforms as well. Does it work in Nokia? Symbian. Symbian. Not yet, no. I think. Maybe not yet, no. But still... I don't like WhatsApp. <laughs> Why? One Why thing, don't you like one WhatsApp? One thing we need to check with chat on as well is the encryption. Because that's one thing that WhatsApp hasn't has been fixed. able to. Have they fixed that? No, they still send messages in plain text. Is it? I thought they yeah. actually... The, no. your, 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 your they fixed the security hole that, that allowed people to update your status for you remotely. To update oh, okay. other people's statuses remotely. Yes. And your authentication is secure. But the rest of your messages are plain text. So there's that thing too. Not that I actually use WhatsApp for anything secure. But... 
Okay. What I don't understand is I remember I remember some time ago already that Samsung announced that it was available on on these other platforms. Um, I, this BlackBerry announcement strikes me as strange. Did they just implement a new feature in BlackBerry? Um, because I remember the client being available on BlackBerry. Maybe I'm just remembering wrong. No, not as far as I know. Interesting. Okay. This this is new. Okay, so basically the only reason we're going why is better than WhatsApp is does encryption. There's encryption. There's free. Look, I don't mind spending. I and don't mind spending one dollar a month for a decent app. Yes, yes, I don't mind. And one dollar a year, I don't mind spending one dollar a year to have a replacement for SMS. Okay. My, my, my main question with this: the, the problem is that there I have a with non-phone client for this? They could. Yes. I don't want it then. Well, I do. Isn't that I why you have G Talk? Yes. Except people don't use Gtalk. And Instead, they use WhatsApp as an IM client. No. Instead of using it, that's the way that, that people use it with me, is they use it as an IM client. Except it's limited to their phones. Whereas with Gtalk, I get, to be, uh, I get to use it across platforms. So it's on my tablet, it's on my phone, it's on my PC, it's N everywhere. My main thing is... And it syncs properly. I don't turn Gtalk on, on my phone, because when it's on, people treat it and chat to me like I'm behind a PC. And I don't want that. On my phone, when I'm receiving messages, I want an SMS replacement. So I want to be able to send short messages and, and get all this information backwards and forwards. But in, in the extent and, and treat it like when I receive a message or send a message, the person on the other, other side is going to treat it like an SMS is sent. Then why not just... Now, as soon as somebody... So the, the only difference it, between, say, WhatsApp and between Gtalk then is that Gtalk has the status icon. Essentially, because as soon as you know one online, pays it as an attention item. to that status icon, you can. I know I WhatsApp has read uh, has read uh, as the read receipt receipts as well. Uh, yeah. Gtalk, yeah. I think. Well, Gtalk sends this person is typing a it's message. Typing messages. Look, yeah. I can also send location. But if it doesn't contacts. send a message, it sends an email to that person's Gmail address. Yeah, yeah. That happened to me. I was chatting to Tim. He went offline sometime, and uh, or I went yeah, offline. That's a standard Somewhere there was feature. a thing, and it sent an email, email. to me but I can carry on the conversation just from Gtalk. Again. Yes. So there's that. Um, but the only thing that I'm really getting here is that there's a status icon, which you can set to away. I know I chat to Jan, and he just doesn't reply to me, and I'm like, well, that's Jan. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's at the office. He's busy. The, the thing is, and I've had it, and specifically, you know, work is qu quite a good example where they're quite bad. If they see me on a chat client, no matter what the time is, no matter, you know, whatever, then they want to, it's a chat client. You know, he's buying his PC, he can see me, he wants to chat to me. Well, they're welcome to try. <laughs> but with WhatsApp, as soon as you reply to a message, they can also assume that you're behind your phone and but they that's, can keep Now I'm behind stuff. my phone. So the, the type of information you can ask me and what you can ask me to do, it, with, it's, it's about the societal rules about sending an SMS and what the, the expectation of that is and the difference between a chat client. Mm. And it's the way people react to you. And it's, it's not very just different. SMS though. You can see the difference in BBM as well. So, you know, people understand you're on a mobile device. You can't type as fast. Um, if you switch to the web-based client for Gtalk, there it shows. It, nobody, check, well, no, I, nobody checks that status I icon. can tell you I've, now. Because yeah, I know when I'm talking to someone on a mobile phone, it shows a little Android. I know it does that. But the person on the other, other side, a lot of the time with the people I'm aware of, which is why I, I do not turn Gtalk on, on my phone, unless I'm expecting a message from that mm -hmm. and something where I've said, okay, I'm, I'm wanting to. I, I do not turn it on because of the way people react to me on it. Yeah. That said, I have chat on on my smartphone. And I, if you use chat on, I'll use chat on. Fair but, deal. <laughs> but, but you won't because you'll be used to uh, – everybody else you're chatting to is, though, is on WhatsApp. Yeah, but if it's just an app running in the background, I don't, I don't care. Um, so uh, I, I have all my people in WhatsApp um, anyway. And so if they want to chat to me on WhatsApp, that's cool. Uh, the message will come mm. there. Um, for chat on – No, but it, it, there's a lot of studies going on that you will get used to sending messages in a certain way. So unless he's instigating the message, there's a high probability you actually have to waste – mental energy to switch to an app you're not used to using. Yes. Or I just won't contact him then. I'll wait till I get behind my PC and Gtalk him. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Until such time that I guess Gtalk for mobile allows you to send the SMSs 
that they that they offer, which uh, Vodacom still hasn't implemented, I believe. Mm-hmm. Vodacom and Cell C. The next topic in. Um, uh, in our agenda, we spent a lot of time on before we started the show. Shall we skip over this one? It's fairly we'll mention it charged. Okay, quickly. Let's, let's mention it quickly. Um, as you all know, Etols, uh, they've suddenly bumped up the price of per K if you do not have the E tag to one Rand seventy four. What was it previously? No, well, it wasn't. It's not actually bumped up. That, that's what they have done is they've created a new category, and now I'm actually going to rant. We're not going to spend quickly go through this. Um, <laughs> Good. There's, uh, there's a. Um, they actually created a new category of user. They call the alternate user, um, and there's a lot of confusion about who classifies as an alternate user. So the original rates still stay in place. Mm-hmm. An e-tagged user who is registered with Sunroll still pays the reduced rate as published by the, fun- the finance minister back in February, I think. Then you get the other rate, which is sort of what we thought was the punitive rate for a non-tagged user. However, they've created an, uh, a, a set of uh, two categories for that rate. They call it the VLN user, I think vehicle license, license, or, yeah, a vehicle license number user or whatever. So that's basically you do not have an e-tag, but you are registered with Sunroll. And, um, and then you pay the 58 cents now, per kilometer. How can you be registered with Sunroll and Without an e tag, yes, you do get VLN users. You can get people who do not want an e tag for whatever reason. I don't know why, um, but they prefer to. Do you to still have to sign their draconian contract? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, and I'm not going to know and until preferred to register. And does that give Sunroll access with their grubby fingers into your wonderful bank account? Uh, if that at all happens, then Sunroll can just kiss me goodbye. I'm, I mean, like I, I do not sign debit orders for anything. I don't even give my bank permission. To take money for my credit card payments automatically. Yeah, same. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's just ridiculous. They they can't insist on a debit order. Um, so, but um, there are also prepaid e tags. So you can get the. I think you can get the tagged rate. Um, but if you're prepaid, so this um, this is now without signing anything. Yeah. Um, and you can get the tagged rate of whatever that is, thirty something cents per kilometer. Mm-hmm. But if the money on that tag runs out, then they'll run on the automatic li- number plate recognition thing, and bill you that way, and then you pay the punitive rate of a, of a rand seventy four. All of a sudden, uh, so so that, uh, and so now let's get to the tricky bit. What an alternate user is, somebody who is not registered with Sunroll and does not have an e-tag is automatically an alternate user. They pay a Rand 74 per kilometer. Um, by the way, this gets far more complicated. I'll get there. Um, the, somebody who has an e-tag but isn't registered with Sunroll and whose prepaid credit on his e-tag has run out is billed as an alternate user. So there are two types to become an alternate user. So, you know, you have registered, you've just run out, you, you can't go and quickly recharge it, but later they just deduct the matter. So they've registered to you, they've registered your e-tag. But you are not registered with Sunroll. I, I don't know why they need you to specific, maybe the registration with Sunroll is the debit order thing. Um, that whole thing confuses me Because I know still. for the prepay, you still need to sign a contract, from what I've gathered. No, you just buy a tag over the counter, as far as I know. Oh, but it's not, it's, not, it's not activated at that point. Oh, do you still... As far as I know, you still need to... That tag you buy over the counter... For, if, I could be wrong on this. I need to go check on this, which I really should do. Yeah. You still need to then go and register. Yeah. So it's not, it's not activated at This that is point. what I've heard many people say. But the, the, the regulations that have come out seem to suggest the contrary, that there is a prepaid e-tag option without registering How with someone. How do you put money on it? We'll have to see. If there's no web interface, that's also an epic fail because I'm not going to go into a shop to load credit onto my e-tag. Yeah, this is the thing. Now, the way I know in England was done, right? They don't, never mind, they stuff this e-tag thing. They, they do it off, off the number plates. Okay. Okay. There is a website you can log in where you, you do it. You can pay with your credit card. We, we are at that point. We have, we have internet in this country. <laughs> well, how can they not have this activated? It's not that hard. It yeah. really, for all their things bullshit it's not that hard they can do it just Plus, if you look at the uh, i know a lot of the developers who worked um on the back end stuff of sunroll mm-hmm. and they're quality developers i mean if this is something that um they wanted to do um you know payment gate with the whole nine yards it, it would have been done yeah um I, I mean you don't even have to use you don't have to build your own payment gateway that's all be done you just use a third party payment gateway we've got i think we've got three or four different options of payment gateway in south africa even now mm. choose your poison yeah yeah i mean you know, pay you and pay fast and pay city uh, and, and yeah, there's, yeah there's lots you can choose from pay everyone yeah 
Um, anyway, and but that said, what I do find funny, right, and, and people are naturally up in arms about this 1 Rand 74 alternate user punitive rate is what OTA is calling it. OTA is the opposition to Urban Tolling Alliance. And, however, we've for months been basically telling Sunroll, your, you will collapse under the overhead, under your own administrative overhead. And we are going to use that fact against you to sabotage your system by causing you to send out bills that we won't pay until you subpoena us to pay those bills. So uh, we've told them how we're going to, de- uh, to, to kill them. To DNS them. Yeah, we told them exactly how we're going to DOS them. Yeah. There we go, okay. sorry. Um, and, uh, and so now they've effectively reacted saying, oh, yeah, mm, the, our, our punitive rate does not cover our administrative overhead, so we need, a new, we need a new punitive rate in order to cover that administrative overhead. And so now the Department of Transport has issued new rates after the Except finance the minister. the punitive rate still right. doesn't cover that if people don't pay. <laughs> All right. No, wait, I, I have an answer to that, right? So in a lot of this, they've been hammered over and over again. There wasn't proper consultation. They haven't followed decent procedures, all the rest of it. Okay, so what you do to solve that problem is two weeks before you go live, without announcing it, without talking to anyone, <laughs> without doing anything, you bump the price up. Yeah. Yes. And on top of that, uh, by the way, the new, regu- the new regulations, or I think you call them regulations, I don't know the legal terms, um, don't make any mention of exemptions for commuter buses or taxis, which the finance minister specifically mentioned. When, In the budget speech. Well, yeah, during the whole budget speech thing. Mm. And now there's all of a sudden... Like no mention of it. So the assumption is that taxis and, and commuter buses are no longer exempt. So all in all, they've really set themselves up for a disaster. Yeah. It, it added to this, this is something that they're forcing us to do. They're forcing us. I don't mind paying. I do mind paying in the whole concept behind it. But, you know, end of the day, I'm happy to pay it. But they're going out of their way to, you know, I'm getting to the point. The, the more they do, the more I want to actually go and go out of my way to go, no, no, stuff you. You've now gone beyond the point where I think you're reasonable. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, anyway let's move yes. right on from that to something else, to something we can laugh about. Something a little sa- funny. So we can ah. laugh about and be sad about at the yes. same time. For those of you who maybe missed the story, maybe we should just give you the meat first. Like, stay with me. ZTE South Africa is basically taking ZTE Mzansi, they no, are no, separate let's, companies. Let's, let's start off at the beginning. <laughs> ZTE, ZTE South Africa is suing ZTE Telcom. ZTE Mzansi is suing Telcom. Yes. Yes. ZTE South Africa is, tr- uh, is, well, is trying to overturn, have a, a high court interdict that ZTE Mzansi have against Telcom overturned so that Telcom can continue rolling out it's uh, upgrades for the for the for its uh, data net, well, for its network in general, yes. but which is going to mean faster ADSL speeds for us plebs. So, um, <coughs> let me say that again ZTE slowly. Is ZTE South Africa is trying to nail ZTE head of Zanzi, but as far as I know, is it ZTE Mzanzi is somehow related. To ZTE Mzansi is a brand licensee of ZTE. ZTE, Mzansi, ZTE owns a minority stake in ZTE Mzansi. And ZTE Mzansi is effectively, let, let's not beat about the bush. ZTE Mzansi is the front company ZTE uses to do business in South Africa with government uh, institutions and with companies that require BBBEE clearance. Yes. Um, so ZTE South Africa, I don't know what their BEE status is. But ZTE Mzansi has like a massive majority BEE shareholding um, to, so that they can do business in South Africa. Um, and apparently uh, there has been a clash. <laughs> uh, what I quite find Between funny the two companies. in all of this, it's, it's like our representatives on the board strongly disagreed with going forward. But having this, the entire board then still voted to go forward with this uh, suing of Telcom. Now, obviously, Telcom has gone to ZC. South Africa, and they went. They went. But maybe they went. Hey, um, how do you th- how do you think we're going to feel about using your equipment in future if uh, <laughs> if you sue us now? If this is how tenders are going to happen from now on? Um, Having said that, if they, they did stuff up their tender and didn't follow their tender, well, no, no, but apparently they did. So this will uh, this will probably come out, and I hope it does come out during the court proceedings. But Telcom holds fast they did, and ZTE Mzansi holds fast they didn't. I would like to share a story from my tenderpreneuring days, <laughs> except mm-hmm. I never got to make any money off tenderpreneuring. <laughs> um, and, uh, ser- in all seriousness, I used to work for Saab, and Saab is, is, uh, makes, makes, uh, does a lot of business by 
doing tenders, right? So basically, that's as a, as a big company who sells big custom systems, that's how you make money. That's how you do business. Tenders come out, you respond to the tender, you win the business, you implement the system. Now, I know this is going to sound like the like horn tooting, but at Saab, we used to do things above board, at least, at yes. least to my knowledge, right? We used, to, we used to get the tender spec, fill in the tender spec, uh, you know, uh, saying what the and the, in the tender spec there is a thing usually called the compliance matrix, and the the person issuing the tender says we want this. You know, they specify what they want from the system, and then you say I comply, I don't comply, and some of them even allow for a type of partial comply, and then you explain why you partially comply. And in my time at Saab, I on on a smaller tender. Um, a landed a was in a situation where a subcontractor sent up their compliance matrix. I did the freaking hard work, told them, because, I mean, people should actually just know, subcontractors should just know, fill in your part of the damn tender. But I went, you need to answer these line items. So I went and fished it out for them, sent it to them, and they sent it back. And they say, fully, they comply, 100%. And then when I check their, their actual data sheet of their product against the spec, it is not compliant. So people lie on compliance matrices to get the bid. I just want to leave that there. <laughs> that's, that's people lie to win contracts? <laughs> say it ain't so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so, I mean, um, the, there, there is a very real possibility that while a compliance matrix said yes, the actual spec of the actual product so said otherwise. No, yeah. Look, having said that, if that was the case, it should be quite easy to rectify. Indeed. And, and it, very easy for Tarkin to go, look, yeah, matches. Yeah, exactly. and, and that's effectively what's been happening during the court proceedings. And I hope, because cutting through the legalese to the actual technical stuff um, is often very difficult. Um, but I hope that the, that the truth comes out, that we know for sure whether Talcom stuffed up the tender or whether ZTE lied in the tender document. Or maybe they didn't lie. Maybe the, the people at ZTE and Zansi just aren't technically inclined enough to understand that they don't comply with a spec. Um, whatever, but that must out. And But until then, this interdict needs to get overturned so we can get cool. MSANS down. All right, yeah. <laughs> we'll move on a bit to something really awesome. Uh, the people e-paper watches, Harriet, I know you pasted this. Oh, yeah. yes, this is uh, a project on Kickstarter that is making waves everywhere. I think they started off, they wanted $100,000 to get their project started. Now, they, uh, it's, it's a watch um, with the screen, instead of it being an LCD or IPS or whatever it is that you want to use on these things, which are very reflective, they're using e-paper. And they're doing some other weird and wonderful things as well. It's going to be compatible with smartphones. There's going to be an SDK. Is e-paper like the stuff the Kindle uses? Yes. Okay. So it's something in that technology. It might not be exactly the same as a Kindle, uh, the Pearl displays, but something like that. So it'll be low battery. Uh, I think they said it'll last for uh, a week before you need to charge and that's with you know constant use. So it sounds really awesome. So they started off, they wanted I think $100,000 and they're now well over $3 million. So they're now at 4.6 million. 4.6 million, there we I go. I just opened the page. So, uh, and that is, is a record number for Kickstarter. It is amazing how these guys uh, are doing. And, and one of the things previous that... previous record was the double fine game. They just beat the double fine. Wow. Um, and they, they've actually implemented a new feature on the watches at the request of the people uh, who are trying to kickstart. So at the request of the fundees, the guys or the funders, the fundees have implemented some new features. And they're asking for input as well. So that is a win right there. And you have until 18th of May to still fund. So if, you, if, if anyone wants to get in on that project, they have a whole pile of options that you can select as well, retail projects. So you can wait until payday before you... Yeah, so <laughs> there, there's still some time for the paymaster to hand over your money. Uh, that's cool. And this is just one of those really cool things that Kickstarter can boost a cool project and take them over and above well, over well, and above what they actually like expected. What they say with these guys, these guys are actually watch makers. You know, they're mm. not some guys wanting to start a new business. They actually have a business that works and is paying for, and they're wanting to release and basically build their new product. Uh, and it's an it's alter, alternate way of finding funding without going to VC capital exactly. or anything like that. So they stay independent. And they get to make, they get to get their business off the ground. They make some products to say thank you to the people who helped fund them. Mm. 
and off it you works. Go. So great. It's brilliant. And go check it out. The watch is pretty awesome. Uh, it is pretty cool. There like, are so many features that I can't even name. It speaks Bluetooth to your phone, so you can like have yes. a pair with the Android phone, and, and with it your will, can use the GPS. To Apparently, do. there's going to be apps for the watch as well. Mm. Yeah, um, as I understand, you know, they're the writing kits. an API, so you can write your own apps for the phone. Like some of the complaints, we said it's only going to be Bluetooth 2.1, not the latest Bluetooth. No, okay, not I don't three. really care that much. Uh, blue, do I want Bluetooth three to my flipping watch? Anyway, well, it's actually oh, it's Bluetooth four. Uh, but the, the advantage is it's lower power. Oh, okay. okay. And it's got fast synchronization. Okay. So, you know, there are advantages in four, but, you know. But probably cost wise, four is going to be more expensive yes. to put in. Mm. Okay. okay. Things like that. Trade off with Also, new be a newer technology, which must mean more dev to get it to work properly. Uh, it might be supported by, you know, the, those extra features will be supported by fewer phones. So you're adding it for very few phones. Um, and maybe the future versions will have it. Cool. Um, into some more mobile news, um, the European carriers. Uh, this is the European carriers have apparently said that Lumia phones are not good enough to compete with iPhone and Android. So if, I know you, uh, okay. you looked at this article. <coughs> Let's I, start I looked there. at it and and giggled a little bit. If, if you read a bit further, it actually it says a bit more. Is they saying um, it's not good enough with the amount of marketing that Windows is putting in? But yeah, they they also say that customers aren't coming into their shops and asking for Windows phones. Mm. They're not asking for Lumias. So the amount of marketing, to me, it looked like um, Nokia and Microsoft were putting a lot of marketing behind Windows Phone. The whole smoked by Windows Phone the campaign. Uh, that's, and that's landed they, in, the, they, they, in the UK now as well. They, so they say to that, that, but I, I was listening to Maybe uh, it's just the sites that we on America. And they say with all the other, like iPhone when it first came out, there were ads running on TV for a couple months beforehand. Really? Okay preparing people and it'll continue you don't just you know you're now wanting to it's a new mm. mindset a new phone where they say like on the day of release they, they, they were huge you know they spent lots of marketing budget and then just stopped you know there's no more efforts running on TV there's just it's sort of yes they're still running on the websites it's maybe doing these things but like smoke by a Windows phone where do you have to go to find out about that Google it well no you've got to go into a store yeah and you've got to know about it actually take right? part now the only people store. who are going to you care about the people who, who haven't made up their minds already about the phone. And, and I mean, the only people who will know about the Smoked by Windows Phone campaign are people who live online, and those aren't necessarily your core customers. Yeah. Um, if you want to, you know, hit the people... I mean, I remember when I was still sort of young in the whole cell phone space, when upgrade time came, I walked into the shop and went, what's cool? And I still remember, and uh, Nokia take note, this is before the smartphone revolution caused by Apple. I went into the shop... And was like, I'm looking for a new phone. Uh, I'm going overseas. And uh, I know I'm going to be commuting a lot on public transportation. I'd like something that can play some good music, please. And I've been using Nokias all my life. And I find them reliable. They're like, do not use the Nokia. The number of returns we had on the E71, E70, you know, the E70 range of devices, which is what your contract falls under, was immense. <coughs> do not do it. I had Have a Sony Ericsson. I, I had an E73. Yeah, not a, not a great move on yeah. my part. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, have a Sony Ericsson. Uh, that and that's how phones sell um, still. Mm. So I think. So I think you get more informed cons consumers now. But um, you know. But the fact is, is people look at advertising. They go based on previous experience, and that's what they go walk into the shop with. So if you're not blasting them with well, big ads, put, the, put this way: if you're not having people walking in asking about a phone, you're then telling them about this great phone. They're going to go, "I don't know anything about it, but I know about Apple and Android." And, and all my, my, you know, my, my geek friend said, go We've get got a 70-year-old family friend who asked me the other day, and I gave him a bit of a stupid, well, we gave him a bit of a stupid answer, but he's like, what's an Android? Because he's seeing all these billboards of Cell C's, Cell C Hearts, Android. He's seeing all the ads. He's hearing all the, the, you know, the chatter about it. I mean, you get it in the, you even hear about Android in mainstream media. You don't have to just go to techie media yeah. to know what, to, to read about Android. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and I don't think Lumia, Lumia, is uh, the or Windows Phone Seven and Lumia is not the household name. Nokia is, so people might still go in and go, "What's the latest Nokia you've got?" Also, having said that, and look in America, apparently Nokia doesn't exist. Yes, so, like but the way we know Nokia, they'll, like, they'll yeah, never do that in America. Yeah, yeah. it's not a top of Motorola range phone. Razor. Actually, I think supplanted them there back in the yeah. day. Anyway, um, the, the the Lumia phone is not top of the range phone. It's still single call. You know, everybody's going to go. Okay, what's your top spec phone? 
Um, having said that, I, I want this one to do well. And I think if Microsoft keeps on putting money into it, I think eventually Windows Phone will do well. And that's the thing which that is, they have going for them. They do have a lot of money that they uh, can just uh, stay in long enough to uh, be able to uh, get uh, it. Well, to they're going to have to keep floating enough. Nokia as yeah. well, maybe. Yes. Nokia can't tank. Yes. Well, so, it, which is good for Nokia. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, I, look, I think back to when Android first came out. You're thinking, why did Google do this? This doesn't make sense. Look at those phones that are released. Those phones are useless. They're not as good as, as, as they are. And they weren't. They, they were, you know, I, know. I used the Dream for a while. It was pretty good. But so the, the original Android. Original HTC Dream. No, no. This is before those. No, the HTC Dream was, was the it? first. on uh, The HTC Chimo. Dream and the Magic. Dream was first, yes. Okay. okay. It was the G1 or whatever it was G1. called. G1. Sorry, G, I don't know. I G1 Dream. G1, same yeah. phone, yeah. Um, but you look, look at them. They weren't quite as good as the other phones. The well, quality buggy. wasn't, that, wasn't uh, as know, good as an iPhone. It, it but wasn't. they kept it. They kept putting money into it, and but, but, but then proved and then proved until where they are now. Yeah. So I think and now the Galaxy Nexus is sexy. Yeah. Uh, talking about companies that have improved and improved, Samsung is apparently launching new devices early in May. I have to go get a visa because I'm going to go to the launch event in the UK. And, every, nice. and everybody is saying that this is where they're going to announce the Galaxy S3. Yeah, they, say, they, they said, come see the new Galaxy or something yeah. like that. So it's probably going to be the whole range, but everybody's going to be there for the S3. So that will hopefully <coughs> be good. Um, yeah. So for those of, and and for those uh, who might not have background, the the first the first really concrete news um, we've heard on the S3 was from South Africa. Yes, when our operators leaked uh, <laughs> MTN specifically, um, that um, which I think they must have had some sort of motive to tell me. Um, but they, they revealed that the S3 would be in South Africa in Q2. Um, I don't remember the exact details of what they told me, um, which is why I write the article, is so that it's all recorded. Um, but I, re I remember you talking about this. I remember you double-checking with them that you know, what they told you is real. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, yeah, so that's interesting. So it looks like if the S3 is being announced at the start of May, a June release looks real. And I think that's what everybody was aiming at. Uh, or at least that's what our operators were suggesting was June, July. So um, it looks like our information was was accurate. Was correct. I think it might just you know it, it might just have to go through type approvals here, and depending on how Vodacom, ATA, MTN, and those guys, if they're not type approving the device already, the bastards, mm -hmm. and they're just not telling us. Um, so yeah, that's uh, it's really good to see that the information was solid. Look, I I'm looking forward to this. I I'm waiting for my next phone. The the, the, the next one was nice. Just yeah, it, it wasn't as good I'm as I wanted. Still not convinced I would ever go for a Samsung Galaxy, one of their TouchWiz phones. Uh, I, look, I'm, just I'm, because I'm of TouchWiz. And they're really expensive in South Africa. That's my only. That's my mm. other concern. No, look, it has to be decent. I need to be able to root it and put a new ROM on it. Which is Samsung warm. have have sort of proven that they want to meet the community, but I would not touch an S3 until they have root and until yeah, there is this thing. Look, unless uh, they also, announce that it's open bootloader. I, I don't case. even no. with an open bootloader. If there's happy. no ROM for it, the, they, open, they need it, open bootload on an S3. That thing will get rooted and ROM'd so quickly. Uh, I guess you because they can yank to. the ROM off, mod it, and put it back on yeah. quite easily. I guess no, it'll it'll go quick. Yeah. Cool. Or they must announce that I can remove system apps with root access. You can at least hide them. I don't want to hide them. I want to remove them because <laughs> I remember with the next one when it came out, it had the stupid Amazon app that kept running in the background. And it just child oh, my battery. Okay. I want to be able to remove them. Remove them. Cool. Anyway, <laughs> moving into our kicker. Two of them. Using maths to not pay a speeding ticket. <laughs> this, <laughs> this was <laughs> awesome. That now, was pretty cool. whether this guy was actually speeding or not uh, is a bit debatable. Uh, but what, was it a speeding ticket? Wasn't he jumping? Uh, so a, he jumped a red Jumped robot. a stoplight or and something. It, he, he went... Yeah, he didn't. Well, that, that he, was he the wrote point a paper of his argument. to he, prove he didn't. Yes. <laughs> sure. And got it published. Got it published. In a journal, apparently. <laughs> With physics. <laughs> and it's just awesome talking to a judge going, look, this is, this is what you... And it also follows the, you can't prove I didn't do this. But by the end of his argument, he had convinced the person who had given him the ticket. That this may have That happened. this may have actually happened and he was unsure. <laughs> Um, that's how good it was basically uh, and the other thing is along with it uh, along with his paper he said find the flaw in my argument <laughs> <laughs> to, to just explain it briefly how it works is it shows you acceleration patterns and how humans are very bad at judging speed at an angle uh, think of a train you know when it's far away it looks like it's 
moving very slowly, and as it gets closer, you just see it getting faster and faster. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, this cop was looking from from an angle, uh, uh, like a perpendicular angle when he was doing this. Also, at the moment when it, he was in front of the traffic light, uh, a car drove past. And in, he says he stopped, he, he did Sorry, he stop, stop over stop a very sh- uh, short distance. So he sneezed, he pushed the brakes very sharply, so he stopped in a very short And then he accelerated. Rate, and then he accelerated. So, but so the, it looked like he didn't actually stop because of the car going past. Um, <laughs> but anyway, the other kicker is... That's one way to get a... I wish we all had um, <laughs> doctorates in physics so that we could have our tickets overturned. Oh, you can use this now. <laughs> it's in a paper. You can just go, look, he proved it for me. <laughs> reference. Just remember to reference collect correctly. Oxford people. Yes, yes. The other really cool one is from Kurt. Silly putty for potholes. For those of you not familiar with non-Newtonian fluids, um, they are fluids at room temperature, but when you do something funky to them, they behave as solids. So in the case of this, they're using cornstarch and water, which is fairly well known. Yeah. And if you poke it really hard, it, it hardens. acts like if a you solid. poke it quickly. Poke it hard and quick. So if you actually get the composition right, you can run over the stuff. It's really cool. So, But you just must not stop on it. Yes, just don't stop, then you'll sink. <laughs> So that, that's the thing is, is with sudden quick movements, it acts like a solid. So these guys have taken cornstarch and water, El Chipo, and come up with a formula um, and a, a way to actually package it to use it in potholes. So when the car goes over it, instead of it, this liquid being liquid, you go over it really quickly with a sharp force, it acts like a solid. Whee! So, But you, you can't do that like at a pothole at a stop sign. Or at it a robot for that matter. I work. think it might work under pressure. Interesting. Now, what's nice about this, though, is when you put in the pothole... And what if you're on a motorbike? <laughs> when, when there's no pressure, it will actually now conform to the hot size of the pothole. That's really cool. That is really cool. So these guys are obviously going to patent their idea. Um, I, I just thought that's a really innovative way to be using cornstarch and water. If you are planning on using this, the one thing they have added, which you should do, is they put a black mat on top of this as well. Otherwise, every time someone sees this in the road, they're going to freak out and break. Or <laughs> swerve. And that will ruin the uh, entire yeah. experience. Yeah, well, the, the whole point of this thing is so that you don't have to break for the pothole. Yes, yes. Carry um, on. Having said this, this is not a permanent fix for the pothole. It is intended until you actually have proper roadworks coming around and fixing it. Um, with this thing is the bags they've got, they've got like a so this should never be introduced in South Africa because our temporary measures well, tend the to thing is this is actually measures. more expensive than putting tar in oh okay per For pothole now. right as a mm. permanent fix you don't want to use this as a permanent oh, fix oh okay because you have to keep replacing yes, yes. cornstarch now if you the thing with this thing is as the water goes out over you just add a bit more water mm-hmm. to it so you can reuse it and that's where the purpose is so it's a quick fix to go in for a city it's actually a cheap quick fix because normally what you should do is you quick fix you put tar in, then later on they'll come dig that out and actually do a proper where they're supposed to relay that part of road. In South Africa, that might not happen. So, yeah. <laughs> With that, I think that's the end of our show. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, so, yes, where can we find you? Uh, you can find me at JanVZA on Twitter. I'm also on Google+, uh, Jan from Yellen. Or you can find me on my broadband. I write articles there. I the slot one or two. <laughs> one or two a day <laughs> <laughs> one or two an Carrot. hour uh, I'd say about dot me slash hockey Z A. you'll find everything you need to know my and I know you also do one or two things on um, my broadband every now and again yes I, I, I currently have these re- these devices which we didn't get around to talking to uh, for review so this is the Sony Xperia S and the LG I don't know uh, Jan would know I, I just got this one that's today. the L3 L3 the there Optimus L3 which is entry level so a couple of reviews and every now and again something on my gaming. Cool. Lots of work. Where can people find you, Tim? Uh, t- at Tim underscore Hawk. Google Plus, Facebook. You're on Facebook? I am very rarely. I, 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 I also technically have a Facebook profile. I have now actually even removed Somewhere. Twitter from my phone. And oddly, it actually, you feel a lot less stressed. It's very odd. It, it, I don't think so, and you don't miss it. So I still use Twitter, so I, but I just use it on my browser. Mm. Um, but now at every moment today, I don't feel this incessant urge to check what's happening. And it, it actually does reduce your stress. Okay. It's, it's worth a, trying. Just a, try it. For, a, for like, as a journalist, I need to know what's happening. So <laughs> that's just not no an option for me. That. True. <laughs> um, I just like knowing what's happening. 
<laughs> no, I do like it. Just I find I've got uh, yeah. Anyway, um, more, more important than that, uh, you can find the mixer. Well, you can't. Ha ha. <laughs> Psych. <laughs> um, please go like us on our Facebook pages and our Google Plus pages. Plus, whichever us on the you prefer, Plus. you don't have to do both. If you do both, with school. Thanks. Um, follow us on Twitter. It it you know it, it does help get, get the word out when we do put messages and stuff like that. Mm. When we do get guests, we don't actually spam you uh, on the Let's Talk Geek stuff anyway. We just let you know when the show's up. Yeah, yeah. when the show's up, when the show is edited and uploaded, when we're doing live shows, and possibly when we have cool guests. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. Check out our other shows. See you next week.